Hello readers. Okay, so we're here for the next installment of Home of the Brave. Um, the things that happened last time were Keck went to school and he met his teacher, Mr. Hernandez and Mr. Franklin, who sometimes comes into Mr. Mrs. Hernandez's class when she loses her patience. Um, and he learns that he has his own desk and his own chair. And he's shocked by that fact. And he says, I don't have enough cows to be able to pay for this. And she's like, oh, education is free. And he, that idea just blows his mind. And then later on in the day, he gets hungry and they give him a blue ticket. And he says that this blue ticket will help him get food. And so he goes into the cafeteria and he gets all this wonderful food. And he's so excited about it. And then Hannah, the girl, who uh, threw the snowball at him, is just like, don't eat the mystery, mate, and kind of gnaws and bites and nibbles at her at his um, appreciation and excitement over the food that is free. Okay? So our next poem is called Fries. I want you to just stop and I want you to think, you know Keck enough by now. What do you think his response to French fries is going to be? Let's just stop and think about that for right now. Good readers make predictions when they read. Um, but we have all these things that are going on in our head simultaneously as we read. That's why reading is the most complex thing that we can do. Um, and so... We stop and we think and we make predictions and we summarize and we make connections. Those are the things that we've talked about so far in our read alouds. And you want to make sure that you're doing that because all of that combined with asking questions is what we call comprehension. That is how you comprehend the text. It's not just comprehension is not one thing. It's kind of like juggling. You, you juggle the ideas in your head and that act of knowing when to predict, when to summarize, when to make connections, when to ask questions, all of that is part of reading. And all of that takes place simultaneously while you're actually saying the words, whether you're saying the words in your head or reading them out loud. Now, there are some students who struggle with reading. And one thing that you can do to help you if you are struggling with reading is to whisper read to yourself. Sometimes that helps the juggling part, okay? So you might wanna try that and it just, just a low whisper. Um, I actually had to do that in order to be able to concentrate I use that as a tool to help me focus so that I could drown out all the sounds that were around me so that I could really dive into the book. And uh, it worked. And so now I can read without whisper reading anymore. So without further ado, fries. We sit at one of the long tables nearby are uh, two students from my class, Jamie, the boy from Guatemala, and Nishan, the girl from Ethiopia. Hey, Jamie says. Hey, I say back. But I can't talk anymore because my mouth is already full of new tastes. Excuse me, I say, when I have swallowed at last. But what is this amazing food? I hold up a brown stick. Fry, Hannah says. One of the five major food groups. Okay, I'm just going to say it. Hannah is a hoot. This fry, it grows in your American ground, I ask. Hannah laughs. A sound like bells on a windy day. I suppose you could say that. You're keck, right? I know because I asked your cousin. 
Hannah passes me a paper cup filled with strange and beautiful red food. Ketchup, she says. You dip your fries in it. I do what she says, then eat. You're a fine cook, I say. Hannah and Jamie and Nishan laugh. I feel glad to have found enough words to make people happy. When a friend laughs, it's always a good surprise. Not knowing. I see your cousin at the apartment sometimes, Hannah says. He's a very quiet guy. I have to think a moment to eat such happy food and think about words at the same time is much work. Ganwa, I say, has many worries. He seems kind of sad, Hannah says. I look at the fry in my hand with its shiny coat of red. I want only to eat and not to remember. But Hannah's words tug like a tight rope on a calf's neck. Ganwa lost his father and his sisters when the fighting came, I tell her. Hannah nods. Her eyes are blue and gray, or maybe green. I can't be sure. I remember a kind doctor at the camp with such eyes. How did he lose his hand? Hannah asks in a gentle voice. I don't know the words for this. Some English words I hope I will never learn. Men came with guns and knives to our village, I, answers. I answer at last. To be in such fighting, Nishan, is very bad, said, says Nishan, is very bad. And what about your family? Jamie asks me. I stop eating. I take a breath. My father and my brother, Luo, they were killed by the government men. I saw it. I pause as a memory pokes at me like a knife in my back. I was lucky to see, I add. Lucky, Hannah asks. Her voice says she does not understand. Nishan looks at me with eyes that know of such things. Maybe Keck means lucky, I know for sure, she explains. Not knowing is the hardest. Yes, I agree, the hardest. How about your mom? Hannah asks softly. I, Gute, grabs my throat. I will not go to that black place today. I try again. She'll come, I say. I'll wait for her. Waiting is hard, too. Waiting is hard, too, Anna says. And I can see that she also knows sad places. I push my tray away. I'm not so hungry anymore. Home. I take the school bus home. It's a long yellow car filled with screaming, laughing students and many paper balls wet with spit. I don't think it would be easy to drive such a car. My aunt is sleeping when I get home. Ganwa enters with a white basket under his arm. They're washing machines in the basement. He says, they're what? I ask. The room down at the bottom of the stairs. I'll show you later. 
He surprises me with a smile like Loire might have made. A big brother making trouble smile. You're like going to do the wash. It's my job, but if you want it, I might let you help. Sure, I say. Although I don't trust that mischief smile, I remember well how Luol and Galois used to tease and test me. Always I was the little child with foolish ideas and silly ways. Always they were too old to bother with me. Unless it was for their own fun. The door to my aunt's room opens and she comes out slowly. Yawning and stretching. How is school? She asks. I would not believe, you would not believe it. I say, they teach you and they feed you and I have my own desk. We're going to visit the zoo where the animals live and the plan, plan, planetarium where the stars live and I'm going to learn how to dunk slam in the class called P.E. Slam dunk, Ganwa corrects. Good, my aunt says, good boy. And she fills a kettle with water to put on the cooking fire. I want to tell her more, but I can see that her mind is visiting other places. I think maybe I like living here in America, I say to Ganwa. Yeah, that's what I thought too. But you never really feel like an American, Ganwa says. You'll see. Why, I ask. Ganwa shrugs. Because they won't let you. He tosses the basket on the sofa. I'm out of here, he says, switching to English. Be home by, my aunt begins, but Ganwa is already gone. And we're going to go ahead and stop here. We're starting to understand a lot more about Ganwar. The author let us in on the big secret that may be the reason why Ganwar um, is kind of bitter. He lost his hand in the village takeover. So that may be the reason why Ganwar says they won't let you be American. I'm kind of curious as to what exactly he means by that. So we will read on and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow to find out what happens in our next installment of Home of the Brave by Catherine Applegate. Read on.